Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And some might say your reasonable service or your reasonable form of worship or something along those lines. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at, so we, we've already looked at Paul urging the people in Rome. And then we looked at the mercies of God. And today we're going to look at what it is to be a living and a holy sacrifice. Um, with the emphasis today on living. So in the, uh, we want to look at sacrifice as part of the whole body, not just the mind or not just uh, the spiritual aspects of sacrifice, but it's the whole person that is involved in this. The uh, Lexham Theological Workbook, Word Book, says the physical substance of an entity that gives it a concrete reality in physical space. With reference to humans, the body can designate the whole person, especially in a physical sense, whether living or dead. And that is their definition of body. And before we continue, then, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful that we are all here today uh, to gather together with you uh, to explore the things that you have in the scriptures, the things that you have for us as believers, and how we ought to live our lives. Uh, the choices that we make each day uh, affect how we live our lives for you. Uh, it's a work in progress, Lord. We know that you're working in us, and all we have to do is allow you uh, to reach to reach into us and and make that work happen. Uh, and and hopefully, Lord, we will be open to letting that uh, be manifested in our lives, not just to other believers, uh, but to the world as we live and walk in it. Amen. So when Paul says to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, he is saying your whole body. Now, Paul as we saw recently, a few months ago, or maybe it was several months ago, uh, it's hard to judge time. I am in Romans chapter 1, or I'm sorry, chapter 12, thank you, in verse 1. As we saw a few months ago, Paul uses the word uh, flesh or in the Greek is sarx, to refer to the physical body. Um, he uses it as opposed to that. He uses sarx to be describe what we make up uh, our being that we might consider to be spiritual, right? So he says that it's the sarx that causes you to fall for things. It's constantly warring with you. And that's how he often uses the word flesh. It's a, uh, it's the battle. Some people will say, you know, uh, I'm the battlefield. Before anything else is the battlefield, because I have to overcome me. And when Paul is driving at that, he's using the word flesh. But flesh is also flesh, right? That's what we just read. Uh, it doesn't always mean that flesh in the scripture, even though Paul often uses it that way is always about <clears throat> that part of us. Uh, because, in fact, the Greek word says that it's a physical material out of which a body is composed. Uh, if we continue on with the definition from the, the theological word book we were just reading from, it says this word denotes the material out of which bodies are composed. <clears throat> they give references. Um, it says it can also refer to the human person whether used alone or in the phrase flesh and blood, as in Matthew 16, 17. It can also be used in reference to the physical descent or the external elements of life. Sarks may represent earthly physical existence with an emphasis on its imp impermanence and inherent weakness. 
Paul often uses sarks to represent the aspect of a person or worldly existence that is dominated by sin and at odds with the things of God. So it has many uh, meanings. It's used in Scripture many different ways. Um, Paul seems to be the only one that uses it in the way we just talked about. But there are other places that we're going to look at. And right now, um, you turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to read about Paul, uh, Christ suffering in the flesh. It says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, <clears throat> no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So he's asking us, I believe Peter here is, he's saying how Christ as a man, as a human being, walked on the earth. We know he was tempted, which we'll read in a moment, but he also lived in the same things that the other people lived that attacked or drew, drew them uh, spiritually and physically to not obey the will of God. Yet Christ did obey the will of God. I think Peter here, as he's telling us, <clears throat> I think I missed some of that, maybe. Let me turn to my Bible there, because I don't see it in my notes. <clears throat> no, I did get it all. So, <clears throat> Peter is asking us, and he says in verse 1, to arm ourselves for the same purpose that Christ suffered. To arm yourself means that you're taking up something and you're getting ready for a fight. And the fight is against what he goes on to say is the lust of men. And so we're to try to shed that lust of men and live for the will of God. So we're going to arm our flesh for the will of God. So kind of opposite of what Paul says a lot, where the flesh is always the thing that's taking us away from the will of God. Peter is kind of saying, yeah, the flesh takes you away from the will of God, but arm it so it won't take you away from it. And in fact, you can use it for the will of God. Um, now turn over to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to read in verse 24. And Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now there's some people that debate a lot about what it means to lack, what, it, what Paul meant by what was lacking in Christ's afflictions. Uh, but I, some say that what Paul was saying was, I am suffering like Christ suffered for you. Uh, he's, he's trying to get them to see something about suffering and being in the flesh. So he is working for them. He is doing things for them, even though he's not there, even though they don't see him. They can know that he is suffering in the flesh for the body of Christ as a whole, as to which they're a part. And so for Paul here, when he uses flesh, he's not talking about the part of him uh, that he might talk about in Romans chapter 7 that's always being pulled or drawn uh, somewhere else, away from what God has for him. And so what we want to do today, as we're talking about the body, is kind of merge these two things together into one part. 
And the reason I went through that is because I have spent a lot of time talking about the sarks as being something, the flesh as being something that's that's warring against us. But it is also part of your body. Uh, and so we're going to put them together and talk about what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, to sacrifice yourself as a living sacrifice, the whole person. Last week, we noted that in Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus gave all of himself, completely of himself. There wasn't any part of him that was rooted down in the world or in something else apart from what God had for him. And we might say, well, that was easy. He was Jesus, the Son of God. How could he do anything different, right? Well, true. How could he do anything different? But fortunately, the scriptures give us several uh, or a couple places where we talk about temptation that Jesus went through. And it's at least, we know at least one time in 40 days, Jesus was tempted just like everybody else is tempted, right? Um, in Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, you don't have to turn there, you can write it down. It says, immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. He didn't just go out into the wilderness. He was impelled by the Spirit. That would be the Spirit of God that dwelled in him. Is that the same spirit that dwells in you? We read that many times in the New Testament, correct? He was impelled to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast and the angels were ministering to him. Now, the other writers in the Gospels uh, give out some of the temptations. Personally, I think he's probably tempted more than just those three things that we read about, that we read about, because he was there, according to Mark, 40 days being tempted. So he had 40 days of somebody, Satan, throwing things at him, trying to get him to waver from what he was there to do. And we know that he resisted. Uh, it seems that to us, well, again, he was the son of God. He must have resisted. And we know that the phrase is just flow out, right? The scripture says, God says. But we also know that he had to have angels ministering to him. So to me, I'm thinking that what he went through was pretty tough. That he had to have somebody come and minister to him. Of course, he was there for 40 days and he had no food as well. And so they kept him going. Uh, as a human being, to, to, to go through what he went through. But James makes some links to temptation. So if we go down uh, to James chapter 1, I have, a, uh, I have something to confess about my Bible knowledge. When I was young, we used to sing a song, and I don't know the whole song, in church. Peter, James, and John riding in a sailboat. And it said over and over again. Whenever I say, turn to, to James or Peter or John, that's the first thing that pops in my head. But in the Bible, they're not in that order. So I always go, nope, got to go back. No, just a little thing of life, right? James says in verses 12 to 14, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Interesting, James doesn't say by his own flesh. He says his own lust. In James' mind, the flesh, the body, the soma, the sarks, he's putting them all together into one piece. And the lust 
is just the thoughts and the drive that you might have towards a certain thing. But to his point, it's not God that tempts. It's us. We're tempted on our own. <clears throat> Jesus was tempted. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, you don't have to turn there, you can write it down. For we do not have a high priest who can not sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. That is Hebrews 4, 15. So we can take some comfort, the writer of Hebrews is saying, in that our leader, our priest, our Lord, went through temptations just like we did. The only difference is that he did it without sin because he gave everything of himself as a sacrifice. Once you turn over, we're close now, and I'm remembering that it's not in the order of the song. First Peter chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 4 through 8. Now, the heading in my Bible, of course, uh, above chapter 4, it might be similar to yours, or verse 4, is as living stones. And I think that Peter here is going to make some of the same type of inferences as Paul makes in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. He says, and coming to him... <clears throat> As to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. And so Peter here, we know, is speaking or writing to Jewish believers. So these folks are also, we should know and realize, part of the body of Christ, as much as any Gentile was part of the body of Christ. The only difference was that they were Jews, and they had a background. Their background um, is in the Torah, in the law. And as youngsters, most of them were brought up knowing those types of things. And so they had some uh, preconceived notions. And so Peter is speaking to some of that. But the gospel is not complicated. God did not make it to be complicated. He made it to be simple so anybody could understand it. So we shouldn't complicate it. But Peter here, of course, uh, is referring to some things in the Old Testament. The One of the places being in Hosea, where he says, first, you're not my people. And then later on, he says, you will be my people, God, to the people of Israel. But Peter is referring, I believe, not just to the Old Testament, but we know to something that Peter heard. Because didn't Jesus once tell some people that, uh, as he spoke first through a parable, but then speaking of himself, that he was the cornerstone, he was the foundation, and that they were to reject it, and they were rejecting it. Paul spoke of the same stone in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. And we know that stone is Jesus. But what I want to focus on here is what Peter just said to the people he's writing to about a stone. And what is that? we go past the part about Jesus being the stone, he said, you, right? Come to him. 
That was Jesus as a living stone. He went to God as a living stone, rejected by men, but precious. Then he says, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So there is a stone that gave everything. And according to Paul, that stone became the foundation, the cornerstone, that everything else was built off of. And that was Jesus. And he wants us, Peter does, as does Paul, he wants us to be just like that stone. Living stones, living sacrifices. Why don't we turn over to 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> And we're going to go to chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 10 down through the end of the chapter. It says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I lay a foundation. And another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on, it remains, he will receive a, war, a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to you. And so now we just said that we are like Peter and we are, or like Jesus, as Peter said, and we're going to be stones. Uh, Paul is saying that we have some type of responsibility to how the stones are being placed ourselves on this foundation. Um, they don't just automatically go there in the way they're supposed to go. We have to do something with, with that, uh, which would be to sacrifice completely um, to be in that. We are stones. It's a choice that we make all the time. Some time ago, I don't know how long ago, but I just was thinking about it and remembering I did something and we talked about stones and fire. Um, I don't remember the, the context it was in. But some stones can be used in fire and some stones can't. And we had talked about uh, the differences in, in the, the chemical makeup and structures of the stone. But one of the most important things in their day of building was how solid was the stone. If there are cracks or air pockets, um, pockets that contain natural gases and such in the stone, when it's heated up, those things will cause the stone to crack or to open up or to fall apart. Um, <clears throat> even so much that a stone could explode from the heat, and pieces could go flying everywhere. 
And so the stone has to be firm. It has to be solid. It has to be able to withstand flame. It's got to be good so that when the building is built, it doesn't fall apart. If you got cracks in it and other stones are laying on top of it and that stone falls apart, now you got to replace it, right? Because it's going to ruin the foundation. Um, <clears throat> you know, I live in an old house and we have a an actual stone foundation. And uh, it, it's... If you ever seen an old building that's, uh, if you go out to Medina and look at the sandstone buildings, they're not all perfectly cut sometimes. They're just different pieces you put in. And over time, sometimes the little ones fall out. Uh, and you think, all right, I think, maybe not everybody else thinks, I think that's no big deal. It's just a little one. There's still mortar there. It's good. But eventually, something eats at the mortar and it starts to go through. And then I could look through the foundation and I could see in my basement. And so now I have to get some mortar and some stone and replace it because it's falling apart. Uh, and you don't want that to keep going on because it could cause some problems for your foundation or let other things into it that shouldn't be in there. So the foundation has to be good and it has to be solid. Paul says that, uh, you know, there's going to be a fire, a refining fire. And Jesus almost talks, or Paul almost talks about that fire. He does talk about it like it's something that's coming in the future. Um, but we'll we'll take a look at that. We want to be alive. We want to be like stones. We want to be like Christ. But we can't just let it go. We can't just sit back and say, it's just going to happen. I just go to work every day and do things and never think about it. You know, that's one of the things I bring up a lot recently is your focus, your intentions. It takes some mental fortitude. That's why Peter says, arm your flesh. That's why Paul says, put on the armor, right? It's uh, As Christians, a lot of times we say, God does the work, just sit back and let it happen. Well, he is doing work, but he's a partner with you. He wants you to work with him. and and. Do things and get your mind set and get yourself firm in what he's doing in your life. Uh, it's important. But God also doesn't want you to stop living life in the world. He wants you to do this as someone who's living in the world so that other people see. Even to uh, my dad spoke last week about the Nazarenes. You know, Solomon says, enjoy the fruits of your labor. Enjoy the work that your hands have done. Right? There's things in life God created for us that should be enjoyed. But the difference is, when even from your point of view and from others' point of view, is something happening? Is God working in you? Can that, is that evident to you uh, in your life? Paul says, again, about being purified. A living sacrifice, we think of sacrifices uh, in the in the past, in the Old Testament, one of the things that sacrifices had in common was they were burned. There was a fire. So a sacrifice has, a, being a living sacrifice has amazing purposes for our lives. And it can bring clarity, I think, to life in general. For us as a believer, part of that purpose is purification. And you might say, well, how how am I being purified right now, right? I got this, and it's getting older, and eventually I'm going to die. And then when I raise up, I'm going to get judged and purified, like Paul just said, and I'll be saved as though it was through fire, through God's fire, we say, that burns off all the dross and scoops it out and all that's left, like he told Israel even, or even David asks, uh, you know, give me that fire. We read Malachi about the refiner's fire and what the purpose of it was for and how that's what Israel was going through. God was doing that for them. It was something progressive. It was something happening. It wasn't something necessarily that, you know, as each one passed away and went to heaven, that they would be refined in front of God. As a living sacrifice, 
as hard as it to be, can be to imagine, we are walking through the refiner's fire each day as we go through things in life. And that fire is working to purify us. Uh, you know, from the inside out, there's a song by Hillsong. Uh, I think it's called Inside Out, maybe. But that's, that's what the, the song is about. Purify me. Work on me. From the inside out. It's because he purifies on the inside that the outside is seen. That's this. That I'm arming, according to Peter. Is it Peter that said that, right? That's what we just read a little while ago. Arm your flesh. Arm yourself so that you can use it for the way it's supposed to be used. God is working in us. Right now, he's working in you. Even when you're just sitting there listening to me, he's working in you. And then when you leave, every day, even though you don't know it, if you're not listening and you're not active, an active participant, it might never seem that he's working in you. But there's something going on. <clears throat> Paul says that he's working in us. And that he's trying to make us something now, which is in the image of his son. And someday that work will be complete, right? Someday. So it's happening. There is an interesting passage. None of you have it with you, I don't think, unless you have a Apocrypha. I don't have an Apocrypha in my Bible today. Sometimes I do if I use my NRSV. But in 2 Maccabees, you can write this down because you can Google it. Chapter 1, verses 18 to 36, there's a description of something called a festival of fire. I'll just read the first couple of verses. It says, since, since on the 25th day of Chislev, we celebrate the purification of the temple, we thought it necessary to notify you in order that you also may celebrate the festival of booths, which is the, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the festival of the fire given when Nehemiah, who built the temple and the altar, offered sacrifices. So uh, without reading through the whole thing, I'll give you a synopsis. We just read about the two sacrifices. Nehemiah uh, helped lead the people that wanted to go out from captivity when uh, the Persian king told them they could go back to their land and rebuild the walls and then rebuild Jerusalem and then they rebuilt the temple. Nehemiah was part of all that. It was a commission given to him after he asked. There was a fire that was used. Uh, they used fire in the sacrifices. And according to uh, Maccabees, the entire time, and this to me is, if it's true, it's miraculous for sure. <laughs> they kept the fire that they used to make the sacrifices going for the entire time that they were in captivity, which was for how long? Hundreds of years, right? From the time that Israel started being taken and then Judah started being taken. This whole time, they kept this fire going in an old dry cistern. It doesn't say where it was because that was a secret. Only some priests or some people knew about it, but they kept it going the entire time. Well, most of the time. It says the entire time. Nehemiah told the priests before this festival of fire, go and get the fire, because they had set up to make uh, a sacrifice. So they go and they get the fire from the old cistern, except there was no fire left. The fire had become a thick liquid. That's all it says, thick liquid. In my mind, I think fire thick liquid oil. I don't know if it was oil, but there was something there, and it wasn't fire. So they come back and report to Nehemiah, who says, go back and dip some of this liquid and bring it. And so they bring the liquid back to the, uh, the sacrifice, 
And he tells them to sprinkle the liquid, some of the liquid, over the sacrifice and the pieces of wood. Um, and then they all stood and waited. And it so happened it was a cloudy day. And nothing happened. Eventually, as the clouds parted and the sun started to shine strong on the sacrifice, the liquid ignited the sacrifice um, from the sun. And the sacrifice was burned uh, up. But the flame kept going. And so then he told the priests to take the liquid and sprinkle it on all the stones around the altar, which they did. And those lit up. And there was a, it almost sounds like there was a competition between the flames. The flame on the altar, as long as it was lit, was bright, put out the other flames where it was sprinkled around. And Nehemiah called this uh, Nephthar. N-E-P-H-T-H-A-R, which in Hebrew means purification. And so this flame or this liquid that burst into flame was a sign of purification of the temple, of the altar, of the people as they came back into the land. And it says that uh, the Jewish people often use the term. Um, as when they're talking about something that was purifying something, although it says they said it a little differently. But I think it's a pretty cool image. And it, for me, after I read that, I thought, well, there's, there's an image for me in there. There's an image for us in there. There was no flame until the sun shone. Everything was covered in clouds. When the clouds broke free and the sun shone, then purification was able to happen. The people stood there. I don't know how long the clouds were there. They could have been there for hours. It could have been minutes, but they waited. And you could, they're probably watching and thinking, what is Nehemiah doing? And then when the sun finally shines, they see what was happening. It's a little purification. To us, it's a purification that happens over and over again. Every moment that we choose to be in the Son, in God. When we choose that moment, I'm going to do right, I'm going to arm myself, and I'm going to work with God, I believe there's a little purification. And Paul talks about that. Uh, this doesn't take anything away from salvation, because Paul says that we are being saved, right? You're saved, and you're also being saved. Uh, it's happening to us every day. In Hebrews 2, 1 through 3, he says, don't neglect such an amazing salvation. Is that a salvation that he's talking about when you first believed? Or does the salvation that he's talking about as a priest has to do for the people when they come during all the different feasts and festivals all the time? All the time, they're coming, and they're being purified, and they're being purified over and over again. That's what Hebrews is about, partly. The priest that we have in Jesus and what he's doing. So back in Romans 12, Paul says that being a living sacrifice, holy, your whole body, put all in as a living sacrifice is reasonable or spiritual. What's the difference between reasonable, spiritual, or rational? As you might read in different translations. Well, I looked it up, and it's not much. It's the idea behind the rational or reasonable. It's your reasonable service because of who your creator is and what he's done for you, that you would be a living sacrifice for him. And you're not only a living sacrifice for him, but you're a living sacrifice for everyone around you because you're living out his kingdom in the world. Many more modern, like the NASB, would say it's spiritual. And I think the problem with that to me is when I think spiritual, I think mental, right? I got to think on God. I have to read the scriptures. I have to pray. And the physical is left out. But it's all, it's both, it's all. You think about the traditional concept of sacrifices, 
from the Old Testament as looking like it's, it's uh, we read places where it says it, it's a picture, right? In Hebrews, it was a picture of things to come. It was something to see. In all that time, we talked about, again, a couple months ago, all that time those sacrifices being made, what does God say in Hosea? He tells us to the, to the, uh, the Sanhedrin, to the Pharisees, go and learn what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What was God desiring? He was desiring the whole person be a sacrifice that they would give of themselves to him and to others in love, totally and completely. So God sees it that way. I'm asking you to do something. And I'm not just asking you to do it for me. I'm asking you to do it for everyone. And we're going to see that as we go through Romans chapter 12. But this is where we're going to end looking at uh, verse 1. It's urgent, Paul says. Urgent. I am urging you. I'm telling you this is of the utmost importance in of your life out of anything you do. Anything you do. To commit yourself to be a living sacrifice. And do it, as he says. Because of the mercies of God, because of what he's done for you, his grace that reigns for all people, do it. And so then when you read on through chapter 12, we're going to see what is it that's so urgent that we have to give up our entire selves for as often as it is possible of us to do in the world, for God, and for others. And we're going to find it's really important. Some basic stuff, but I think stuff that we probably miss all the time. That's why Paul says, urgent. Amen. And we'll see you back here.